Welcome back to Sociology 226. This is Emil Durkheim Video 2. In this video, I've got three jobs. The first is to explain to you what Durkheim means by social solidarity. Next, I'm going to give you two examples of social solidarity, looking to the sociology of the law and the sociology of religion. This will get you ready for your two-paragraph response. Let's do it. Durkheim's early work looks to social solidarity, patterns of regulated behavior. In the Division of Labor and Society, Durkheim argues that there are two different types of social solidarity that will exist in any and all social organisms. This is really important. No matter what kind of society you have, so long as it is a society and it has a duration, there will be solidarity of one sort or another. So two different forms of social solidarity. Mechanical solidarity, or solidarity by similarities, and organic solidarity. Solidarity arising from the division of labor. How do we work together, and how do we define ourselves accordingly? This is Durkheim's initial form of inquiry. Let's look to mechanical solidarity first. Lesser developed, or as Durkheim and not me would say primitive societies, are those where individual roles are more or less similar and the collective mind is very much in full force. Individual differences are rarely present, or tolerated, and the individual consciousness is very weak, if present at all. Recall, this isn't just about individual consciousnesses, but also about moral codes. Each member of such a society is subject to the whim of the collective morality equally at all times. This is mechanical solidarity. We can contrast this form of solidarity with organic solidarity. Durkheim is going to argue that as societies become more dense and as more members enter into the social system, they must become more complex. They do not become more complex because they become more civilized. They become more civilized because they must become more complex. Earlier, I said that solidarity doesn't go away as we move from lesser developed societies. It just takes on a different form. Here we can think about a single-celled organism versus one with a variety of organs that maintain it. Though each part has a different job, it requires the other to do their job in order to keep everything working. The social organism becomes more complex as more tasks are distributed throughout. Even though everyone is not as subject to the same rules, the whole thing keeps going so long as they all work in concert. Here, there is a key argument. Organic and mechanical solidarity exist on a spectrum. Each system is as developed as it is based on the distribution of tasks internal to it. As we progress from one to the other, we move away from the collective mind to the individual consciousness. It isn't like they go away, but their relative strength is determined by the tasks distributed throughout the social system. Remember, Durkheim sees individualism as a social product. We are individuals so long as we are granted these attributes by the collective mind. Let's look to these two forms of social solidarity through the example of the law. In the previous video, I used the example of hockey to tell you about Durkheim's sociology of rules. One of the major readings of Durkheim is as a functionalist, suggesting that social institutions allow society to function as an organism by maintaining social order. If social forms are to continue to exist, they must be regulated. The law and the legal apparatus, then, represents an institution that allows social order to be maintained. It assigns roles and addresses deviation from those roles. We need rules to have society, and these rules are enforced by the legal system. We have two different forms of social solidarity, mechanical and organic. In one, actors are treated similarly, assigned the same function, and act in the same way. This is mechanical solidarity. In the other, organic solidarity, actors are differentiated and yet related within the same complex social system. In the division of labor and society, Durkheim gives us the example of the law to explicate these two forms of solidarity. Durkheim gives us the example of religious law as the basis for mechanical social solidarity. We can think here of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not is the basic phrase that comes to mind. Each of these is applied equally to all members of society uniformly. Don't kill, 
don't steal, don't covet thy neighbor's wife, don't offend the collective morality of mechanistic societies. The institutional role of religious law is to maintain social order in a mechanistic fashion. Durkheim argues that as societies become more complex, as different tasks become distributed throughout the organism, laws must accommodate it. It's not like we don't have criminal law anymore, but the kinds of laws that regulate behavior must adapt to different non-criminal conditions in order to keep things working. To look at the law morally is not to rank crimes, but to look at how legal restrictions promote social solidarity. This contrasts with organic solidarity, solidarity by differences. Durkheim argues that we eventually need institutions that promote differentiation. With contract law, for instance, different types of social roles emerge, and moral obligations are distributed asymmetrically. Consider the example of a residential lease. With the lease, we don't just have a bunch of shared you-musts that apply to both you and the other contracting party. Instead, we have a distribution of rights and responsibilities that are different, based on your role in the contract. The landlord must save your check for last month's rent. Or e-transfer. Whatever. You're not allowed to store garbage in your living room. The law has a productive, rather than just restrictive, function in the way that it regulates behavior. In our society, we have both types of law at work at once. But, and this is Durkheim's point, you can certainly have a society that only exists on repressive law. This is the basic form of society. As the organism becomes more complex, we introduce all sorts of different laws by necessity. We need laws for all the different types of work, for servers, for teachers, for policemen, or policewomen. We need laws for student loans. We need laws for copyright, for liquor stores. As society increases in the number of different tasks performed, we get so many more civil laws than criminal ones. We have both kinds of law, but way more laws for different social tasks. For Durkheim, the law is the expression of collective morality. It is both enabling and constraining, often at the very same time. Finally, I want to address deviance and punishment. If institutions like the law allow society to function, there must be some mechanism for dealing with those who don't follow the rules. Remember, Durkheim argues that deviation from the rules of society is normal. So long as there are rules, there will be rule breakers. The test of a lasting social form is the ability to manage these deviations. When we talk about the functions of legal institutions, then, think about the role that policing and the justice system play in managing offenses to the collective morality. Those actions that we deem heinous are, in Durkheim's view, those that offend the collective morality the most, and those punishments we deem acceptable versus unacceptable are also to be placed against the backdrop of the collective morality. You can read David Garland's Punishment and Modern Society, which has two chapters on Durkheim, to explore this way of thinking further. You won't, but you should. A final point on deviance. Durkheim is going to argue that deviance is normal so long as society continues to exist as a regulatory force. That is, at all. But Durkheim is also going to argue that deviance from established roles is necessary for social change. Deviance is normal, as is its challenge to the conservative nature of social institutions. Society must have rules, and must have rule breakers. Let's switch gears and turn to the sociology of religion. Durkheim's sociology of religion gives us another place to explore social solidarity. The Elementary Forms of Religious Life is my favorite book by Durkheim. Looking to ethnographies of ritual practice by tribal groups in Australia, Durkheim argues that there is no fundamental distinction between social organization in advanced societies, like early 20th century France, and those studied in Australia. Both rely on classifications of people, an understanding of the world, and institutions that promote social order. The key theoretical concept here is the sacred, that which must be made and kept distinct from the profane, the stuff of everyday life. All religious life is based on this distinction, as is all life more generally. Here the focus is on how we make meaning in religious and secular life. 
Durkheim argues that religious rituals, in Australia or anywhere else, serve to support social order. They allow us to stand outside the boring moments of mundane life and ignite the collective energies that bind humans together. Religious ceremony is a way to make meaning together, expressing the will of society that lies dormant in all of our major social institutions. All societies have sacred components, and these components reinforce social solidarity. Some societies rest their faith in gods and creators, others in scientific understanding of things, and reverence for the autonomous individual. Some do all of these things. Regardless, sacred life is a fundamental part of human existence. We can see the consequences of religious order as social order in Durkheim's classic, suicide. Let's look at it a bit more closely. Durkheim argues that the suicide rate is a moral attribute found in all societies. Remember, he is describing moral attachments, not telling us what to do. Durkheim argues that we can look at relative rates of suicide to see where social solidarity is weakest. In this sense, suicide is not an individual act, or not only an individual act. Isolated individuals are the outcome of the common moral order. Suicide is a sociological problem. It is a problem based in moral attachments. As one of the first books in statistically driven sociology, the book is already a classic. What matters to us right now is that suicide varies greatly through religious groups. Durkheim argues with statistical evidence that individually minded religious groups, in his case, European Protestants, commit suicide at a far greater rate than the more collectively minded groups, namely Catholics and Jews. As I mentioned in the last video, Durkheim is looking to religious life as a source of social solidarity. Groups in communities that are more closely knit and display lower levels of individualism are less susceptible to suicide than more individualized ones. This is extremely important in Durkheim's age, where secular society is eliminating the religious institutions of the old social order. What originates in a descriptive study of religious life is in fact also an indictment of the normlessness found in mass society, what Durkheim would call anomi in both the division of labor in society and in suicide. The problem is not only alienated labor, but rather social institutions that do not promote social integration. Whereas Durkheim's early work focuses on the collective consciousness, his later work focuses on collective representations. Let's look at the difference. There is a major difference between Durkheim's earlier work, found most clearly in the division of labor in society, and his later work in the elementary forms of religious life. In the former, Durkheim talks about the collective consciousness, in reference mostly to the ways we think about ourselves as individuals and as members of society. This we can think of as a group psychology, insofar as the group has a mind of its own, irreducible to the mind of the individual. We think alone, yes, but a great deal of our conscious life in society is thinking together. In his later work, however, Durkheim moves from the content of what we think of together to the categories of thought itself. In the elementary forms of religious life and primitive classification, remember primitive and scare quotes, Durkheim is going to argue that categories of thought are the outcome of social divisions. The category of space, for example, is derived from the spaces we allocated to particular people in the world, before a measurement that we use to understand things in terms of spatial coordinates. At least, this is the argument that Durkheim and his nephew Maus are putting forth in their short book, Primitive Classification. Despite its regrettable title, the book argues that the scientific categories we use to understand the world are no different than the social categories deriving from the religious organization of society. So while Durkheim's early work deals with the content of thought, for example, what acts are to be punished and who's a deviant, the later work looks to the way we think about the world at all as an outcome of social order. So how do we do Durkheimian sociology? I'm going to give you two readings. One of them is classical and the other one is more mystical. I have to emphasize one is more traditional and the other more out there. 
If you read a classic theory textbook, you will get the first. It is this. Durkheim wants a science of society. All social forms have attributes that they share on a spectrum with others. Relative levels of crime, solidarity, marriage, suicide, etc. We can take these attributes, examine societies through them, and come up with the laws that govern human conduct. If societies are going to continue being societies, they will have these attributes. This is largely consistent with the reading I presented you in the last video. In short, societies have objective characteristics, and it is the job of the social scientist to figure them out and make theories about them once we have hard data. This I will call the classic reading of Durkheim. There is, I think, another more mystical reading. This focuses on Durkheim's reading of religion in the elementary forms. Whereas in the earlier work he looks to moral facts, in his later work, Durkheim focuses on how human meaning is distributed in collective life. Here the focus is on how emotion is distributed through religious acts, how moods can flow in and through public life, and how sacred forces and energies shape individuals. Here, Durkheim puts scientific classification and religious categories on the same level. They both emerge and take shape in collective life. While the classic reading is likely more true to Durkheim's stated goals, a secondary, mystical reading is far more interesting to me. Rather than objective facts, we have forces, energies, and moods. While the second may be more interesting, the first is the reading that will inform much more of the classic sociological theory we will read in this course. We will find one of these readings in the work of Talcott Parsons in terms of a scientific sociology, and another in the work of Harold Garfinkel, focusing on meaning. In summary, one of these readings is more statistical and scientific, and the other one is just vibes. That's it for me. Now it's your turn. In two paragraphs, between five to eight sentences in length, and with reference to the readings, one, explain how Durkheim's social facts can be used to study morality. Two, come up with an example and show how Durkheim would study it. Remember, if you don't incorporate the readings, you're not going to do better than a B-. See you next week.